So there's an, definitely a certain amount of discord going through our country over this last week with the you no know, riots that have been taking place over the last year, over various incidents that have happened leading up to the riots that have taken place in D.C. Um, we, we've seen kind of just this general narrative of discord and distrust between different halves of the nations. Top it off with this week, and then you have uh, you no know, supporters of the platform uh, Parler, where this platform, this conservative platform, has gotten taken off uh, the internet essentially because they can't find any service that will uh, support them. And you have those who support Parler uh, claiming that this is a violation of their uh, First Amendment rights. This is a free speech violation. And then on top of this, there is the uh, almost seems like. Uh, the bishop has made what many people seem to uh, believe is a controversial request that we pray for the president-elect and vice president-elect who are going to be taking office soon. So this week, we're going to kind of examine some of the chaos and confusion which has resulted from this culture of brokenness we live in, that the culture that we're in today. And I would like to start from reading from the book of Deuteronomy. It says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not have other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or a likeness or anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not bow down before them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, bringing punishment for their parents' wickedness on the children of those who hate me, down to the third and fourth generation, but showing love down to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. The word of the Lord. My name is August Klein, the St. Anne Youth Ministry Podcast. And nomine patris, fili, spiritus, sancti, amen. Pater Noster, qui es in Celi, sanctificator nomen tuum. Aveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in Celo et in Terra. Panum nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie. Dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut nos dimitimus debita nostris. Et ne nos inducas in tentationum, sed libera nos a malo, amen. Sancta Anna, or pro nobis. Sancta Ioannis, Paulus secundum, or pro nobis. Sancta Augustini, or pro nobis. Sancte Benedicti or Pronobis. In nomine Patris, Fili, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Now, before we get too much into what's going to be the bulk of this podcast, um, I want to actually re- re- uh, share a story that you should be familiar with. Um, this is going to be taken from the chapter uh, from the book of Genesis, where it says So the Lord cast a deep sleep on a man. And while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. The Lord God then built the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman. When he brought her to the man, the man said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one body. The man and his wife were both naked, yet they felt no shame. Now the snake was the most cunning of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. He asked the woman, did God really say, you shall not eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the snake, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, you shall not eat, eat eat it or even touch it or else you will die. But the snake said to the woman, you certainly will not die. God knows well that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods who know good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and that the tree was desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made blowing cloths for themselves. Now, this is like the source of all of human brokenness right here is the original sin. And the original sin we had was a distrust of God. Um, in a way, it goes, it was the first commission of the act of idolatry, which we just mentioned in our reading for this podcast from the book of Deuteronomy. The first commandment 
you shall have no gods before me. Um, Eve told the snake that, you know, when they eat the tree, that they will die, that they aren't supposed to eat of it. And the snake caused her to doubt that. And not caused her, but no, and he compelled her to distrust. But it wasn't very hard to bring that out of her. And she distrusted God's goodness. And she didn't believe that he was as good as he claimed to be. And so what happened is she ended up taking this desire for wisdom and knowledge, which the snake said that she could have. And she decided that that desire for knowledge is more important than her desire to please God. She essentially made this wisdom her God. And her husband was like right there with her the whole time. It's not like he went off somewhere else or he came up unawares afterwards and said, oh, what did you do? It, was, it, it says that she gave the apple to her husband who was with her. Because there's no point where he left the scene. So both of them consciously, knowingly decided to take something that they knew was bad for them, that God said was bad for them, and to want and desire that thing more than God, to let it take the place of God in their relationship. Now, this is something that you know, we all do in various ways. And this is, is a lot of why that as time is go on, goes on and society becomes, in a way, more fallen, that it's not just that we have things that we make more important God is that we are accumulating more and more things that are make that we put in the place of God and we make more important to him. And as we put more things in the place of God and give it the attributes that belong to God, the more fallen our society becomes. And this isn't just like we talk about idolatry and it's not just like statues. Um, in, the, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 2113, it says, Idolatry not only refers to false pagan worship and remains a constant temptation to faith. Idolatry consists in divinizing what is not God. Man commits idolatry whenever he honors and reveres a creature in place of God, whether this be gods or demons, for example, Satanism, power, pleasure, race, ancestors, the state, or money, etc. Jesus says you cannot serve God and mammon. Many martyrs died for not adoring the beast, refusing even to simulate such worship. Idolatry rejects the unique worship of God. It is therefore incompatible with communion with God. Now, you have people on both sides, all sides of the political spectrum, that have made certain things idols for themselves. And in, we'll get in a little bit about kind of, you know, you, one side may be looking at the other and trying to decide what it is the other side should be you know, given up or what they're idolizing. But the thing is, we all idolize certain things. Now, since I'm assuming that most of the people that listen to podcasts may be of a conservative bent, that, um, that we will probably address a few more of those ideals at one thing. Because there are things that, as you know, everybody really, and it's, some of these things, everyone, uh, both sides really treasure but we've made these things gods instead of you no know, put them in the proper place. You no know, things like capitalism can be a god. The free market can be a god. Now that doesn't mean you no know, one should uh, you no know, react to that by embracing communism or socialism. Both of those are condemned by the Roman Catholic Church. They were condemned in the decree against communism, which was published in the Acta Apostolicae Sedis on July first, nineteen forty nine, under the authority of Pope Pius the twelfth, I believe. So that's not anything we can embrace. Um, there's other things that we actually can at, at times consider idols. The Constitution, the First Amendment, those are right to vote. Um, you may have remembered me quoting Testament of Valencia uh, Nostre in previous uh, podcasts by Pope Leo XIII, where I address where Pope Leo XIII expresses certain concerns about things that we come to value from these and how we can give them an improper place. So like all these things like I just mentioned, they're actually very good things. They're very good. You know, they, they can be used for the great benefit of mankind. Capitalism, free market, be used to really elevate the condition of mankind to give us the time to worship and do the things that we should. The Constitution protects a lot of our freedoms um, and gives us a government that's supposed to be for the people, by the people. The First Amendment protects our right to be able to speak and share our faith. Goes, and we have a right to vote so we can participate in you know, the forming of our government. But the problem is these things can't save us. And a lot of these things are ones that even before we look to the faith, there are a lot of people who look to these to save us. We have to have capitalism. 
because that's what makes everybody rich because extreme poverty has been greatly decreased with after the advent of capitalism, which is true. But a question I pose to my youth sometimes is say you have a society that has a 50% extreme poverty rate, but 50% of the population goes to heaven. Now, say you get the extreme poverty rate down to 10%, but only 5% of people are going to heaven. Which society do you think is actually the better society? Is it the one that has less poverty and less people going to heaven or the one that has more poverty, but more people going to heaven? Um, it's just a, what question to contemplate there. But capitalism does great things, but we also need to make sure that it doesn't become unbridled capitalism, which, again, Pope John Paul II has condemned. Pope Leo XIII, he condemned this in his, uh, in his encyclical uh, Rerum Navarum. Um, and then the free market, now those are really tied together. There's a slight difference between free market and capitalism. But the free market is, again, one of those things that if we look at this to free market as this is what's going to save us rather than God himself, who only salvation comes from God, we are guilty of idolatry. We have put it in the place of God. Capitalism and free market are tools to be used in the service of God, not something used to supplant God. And we do the same thing with the Constitution, even. The Constitution is a tool that we can use to serve God and to protect our liberties. But when we look at the Constitution, say without the Constitution, everything falls apart. Without the Constitution, Christianity is going to fail. Constitution, the Constitution doesn't protect the church. God protects the church. And the Constitution serves that, including the Bill of Rights. Some of those things in the Bill of Rights, like the First Amendment, the right to speak. And this is one of the ones where there are so many times where people look at the First Amendment, and they even apply it to our personal, secular lives. Not, and they say, well, we can't say something to this person because they have the right to free speech. This platform can't censor somebody because they have the right to free speech. And they'll even say to people about those who are talk, speaking against the church, and they'll say to Catholics, goes, well, you can say whatever you want out of the church because you have the right to free speech. The problem is people are taking the right to free speech, which restricts the government, and they are making this an idol of themselves. It means that free speech to the exclusion of all other things, and this is going to protect us, that everyone should have the right to say whatever comes to their mind. The problem is this is a American virtue. It is not a Catholic virtue. And we'll get in a little bit about how free speech doesn't apply to members of the Catholic Church, in as much as you can't just go and say anything you want to about whatever to the church without repercussion. Because just with everything goes, there is the right way to use things. There is a right way to use speech. Um, the Bible exhorts us not to use profane language, not to engage in silly talk, which means that there are ways that we aren't supposed to talk, which means we aren't free to speak however we want. But we do have this fr uh, freedom to speak well, to speak in, in uh, for the good, to speak on behalf of the good, to speak on behalf of the church for the betterment of mankind. We are free to do those things. We're not free to just say whatever we want. When we get to that point where we say, well, I can't confront somebody else and say that they shouldn't say something you no know, regarding the faith or anything, is to make an idol out of the First Amendment. And the right to vote kind of does that too, and in two ways. One is when you have the Christian or the, especially the Catholic that you know, votes for a certain particular cause and it doesn't pursue it, doesn't evangelize outside of the vote because of the fact that they voted. When we do that, we act like if we don't have the right to vote again, the faith will fail and everyone will persecute the church. That's making the vote an idol instead of God. We're worshiping the vote instead of God, saying the vote saves, not God. But it's only God that saves. The vote only works when we use it as a tool to further you know the cause of God, to further his plan for mankind, to help bring other people to him. It doesn't work when we use it as an exclusive means as if nothing else is required. The other one is when we talk about the vote, we talk not in the sense of electing government officials, but this is the th thing in particular that Pope Leo XIII cautioned about in his uh, letter, uh, Testa Benevolentiae uh, Nostrae, is that when we start taking the vote, we put such an emphasis on the vote and our representation or our right to speak that we start thinking that we can start speaking against the church or we should start having a say in the church of how it's run and stuff like that. Goes, Pope Leo XIII was cautioning, he goes, those freedoms and liberties you, that you enjoy in your secular government don't apply to the church. You do not have the right, you do not have the freedom, you don't have the liberty to have a say in how the church is run. That's not something that applies. To think it does is, again, idolatry, and is to put, um, take the vote and take representation 
and to make an idol of it and say, oh, I deserve either right of these things. If I don't have this right, then you know, the church is going to fall apart if I don't get my say. We don't have that right, and again, it can become an idol. As for the authority of the church, um, there's a lot of confusion it seems, about how far that extends. Um, if you listen to St. Thomas Aquinas, he actually talks about authority because there are people that are arguing against authority in general. In the Summa Theologica, St. Thomas Aquinas says, a subject is bound to obey his superior within the sphere of his authority. For instance, a soldier must obey his general in matters relating to war. A servant and his master in, both, in, in matters touching the execution of the duties of his service. A son and his father in matters relating to the conduct of his life and the care of the household and so forth. Now, we are obliged, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, to listen to the authorities over the matters of which they have authority. So like the church, the church has authorities of faith and morals. They don't have authority in like science. They're not authoritative in that. So when it comes to faith and morals, this is where we're supposed to listen to the church. The church is the one that has the authority. No lay person has this authority. We may have the competence to talk about it, but we don't have the authority to talk about it. And the authority is going to trump the competence. So the authority to speak on faith and morals, on the uh, judgment of the church, to speak on what we should be doing as a matter of faith and morals, as uh, faithful Catholics, that belongs to the church. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2246, it says, it is part of the church's mission to pass moral judgments, even in matters related to politics, whenever the fundamental rights of man or the salvation of souls requires it. The means, the only means she may use, are those which are in accord with the gospel and the welfare of all men according to the diversity of times and circumstances. So even when it comes to politics, the uh, church doesn't have the authority to say this is what you have to do in politics, but they have the authority to pass moral judgment on things that are being executed. And as Catholics, as we have to listen because we have to listen and obey the authority of those who speak on the matters of the moral implications of what's going on. We are required to do this as part of being Catholic. And even here, even related to politics, this is within the realm of what the church says. Now, in all parts of the church, again, the authority is the church, not the lady. So when it says the means, the only means that the church may use are those which are in accord with the gospel, the church is the authority on stating what those means are. The lady do not get to come up and say, well, you know what? I don't have to listen to him because their employee means not supposed to. That's up to the church to decide. And we can share our concerns and opinions, but we cannot condemn and berate the church for that. Now, <clears throat> to go on, I want to uh, explain, because we are going to go to the Code of Canon Law a little bit. The Code of Canon Law isn't just a bunch of rules to throw at people. It's actually a very good catechetical tool. Because there's a lot of the stuff that the Code of Canon Law codifies that is an expression of the moral truths and the teachings of the church, that we can learn what our responsibilities are there. So such as in Canon 212, Section uh, 1 of the Code of Canon Law, it says, Conscience of their own responsibility, the Christian faithful are bound to follow with Christian obedience those things the sacred pastors, inasmuch as they represent Christ, declare as teachers of the faith or establish as rulers of the church. Again, who has the authority to declare that uh, when they're representing Christ? It's, it's the church. The lady don't have that authority. We may have questions. We may not understand, but we don't have the authority to say, no, they aren't representing Christ now. The bishops say that. So if you're going to try and make any determination, the best you might be able to do is say, well, 95% of the bishops are saying one thing, 5% are saying another. If this is a matter of representing Christ, you might want to go with the majority of the bishops. The ones that are in communion with the church, with the pope, um, would be a good way to judge that. But like I said, we are bound to follow the Christian obedience. We have to listen to our magistrates, to our bishops. And this isn't just a kind of, well, yeah, they're the bishop, but they're not. As the thing recognized, goes, the bishop by himself is not infallible. Goes, so, but if you're going to say that, well, yeah, but he's not infallible, so I'm going to listen to him. Um, we can turn to Canon 735 of the uh, Code of Canon Law, and it says, although the bishops who are in communion with the head and members of the college, whether individually or joined together in conferences of bishops or in particular councils, do not possess infallibility in teaching, they are authentic teachers and instructors of the faith for the Christian faithful entrusted to their care. The Christian faithful are bound to adhere with religious submission of mind to the authentic magisterium of their bishops. So, 
So in case there was a question about whether or not what they're saying is infallible, code of canon law, the church teaches. It doesn't matter if they're teaching infallibly. They could be wrong, and you still have to listen to them. Jesus says something about this in the scriptures, too, when they're talking about the scribes and the Pharisees, um, when they are prescribing things that are really not right. And Jesus says, they have set themselves, themselves on the chair of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they say, but don't do what they do, because they preach and they do not practice. So if it is that your bishop is teaching an error and he's doing something he shouldn't, he goes, do what he tells you, just don't do what he does. He goes, be that example of what the church is supposed to be. But we have to be obedient to them. So um, again, it goes, uh, Thomas Quinn has said, uh, notes that this is a subject is bound to obey a superior within the sphere of their authority. Canon 735 really expands the sphere of the authority to include a lot that we really can't question about, um, that we can't, well, disobey and make up our own mind. We can't just decide what we want to do. Now, again, we do have the right to question. If we don't understand, we can share our concerns about certain teachings respectfully um, with the dignity to do their office. And it actually even says that in Code of Canon Law. If you go back to Canon 212 and you go to Section 3 instead, it says, according to the knowledge, competence, and prestige, prestige, which they possess, the laity, you know, or all the Christian faithful, I'm sorry, they have the right and even at times the duty to manifest to the sacred pastors their opinions on matters which pertain to the good of the church, to make their opinion known to the rest of the Christian faithful, without prejudice to the integrity of faith and morals, with reverence towards their pastors, and attentive to the common advantage and the dignity of persons. So, one thing to keep in mind, this says, according to the knowledge, competence, and prestige. Most of us don't have the knowledge, competence, and prestige that our bishops do. We aren't on that level. We don't, we don't have enough knowledge. We don't have the same knowledge that the bishops do. They have spent their entire, dedicated their entire life to knowing and understanding the faith. We don't have the same knowledge they have. The competence, the, and in this way, kind of the wisdom to talk about it, we haven't focused our lives on that as well as they have. We haven't spent the hours in prayer. We've had other jobs that we have maintain. And a lot of times, even our free time, we don't dedicate our free time to the faith in the way that even the bishops and the priests do. Those, uh, a vast majority don't. Because if we have, honestly, because if we have 65% of Catholics don't believe that Jesus is God and 75% don't believe in the Eucharist, the rest of us aren't really spending that much time in prayer and coming to know and learn the faith the way the bishops have. So our, we don't have the same competence that it is. And this, and this is, uh, these first are the ones a lot of your theologians will have that kind of knowledge competence for them to discuss it with them. And then, again, if I'm just, you no. Know, a uh, lay person walking around my church, I'm not really involved in a whole lot. Even if I am involved in stuff on the parish level, I don't have the prestige that the bishop does to be able to go up and start comp uh, to be complaining or contradicting or speaking against the bishop. I don't have the prestige to do that. Lacking these things, it's every, our ability to do these things is according to the knowledge, competence, and prestige we have. If we lack these things, we don't have the knowledge, competence, and prestige to be able to go do that. Uh, ill effect of the social media and the way information is spread now is that despite that goes, we all tend to think we do. And then we all put our opinion out there and people give it an equal voice, equal weight a lot of times, especially when we agree with what's being said, even if it's wrong, we'll give equal weight to it or more than we do like say the bishop. And then we'll start picking sides against the bishop on social media or other platforms. So, but even with this, because there's some to agree with which make our opinion known to the rest of Christian faithful, but without prejudice to the integrity of faith and morals, which means we have to do everything we can to maintain the integrity of faith. We cannot cause division. So we cannot, even when we're you no know, trying to find, a, find understand the differences between what we believe and what the bishop is teaching, it has to be, we have to do it in a way that's uh, unitive, not in a way that's animus. We cannot cause anonymity between other faithful. Everything we should be doing should be to bring the faith together and not cause schism, not cause scandal, not cause people to fall away from the faith and want to do whatever they want to. We have to do this all with the mind of the unity of faith, not with the desire to be right or say, I'm not a fan of the bishop. And I want to express my opinion now because it's a good opportunity because I disagree with him. Um, Canon 1373 actually addresses how serious this is. If we decide that, well, maybe in this case, we're serious in the issue, that I need to be more aggressive, need to be a little more um, of some, I guess you would say upfront, but you no know, very uh, you know, expressive of opinions contrary to faith. Canon 1373 does say, 
A person who publicly incites among subjects animosities or hatred against the apostolic see or an ordinary because of some act of power or ecclesiastical ministry or provoke subjects to disobey, that, disobey them is to be punished by an interdict or other just penalties. So in case you don't know what an interdict is, interdict is, interdict is where you are denied the sacraments, all the sacraments, and not forever necessarily, but you are not allowed to receive any sacraments, even reconciliation, until you are reconciled with your bishop and he lifts the interdict. Goes, so if we do any of this, we incite animosities or hatred against them because of any ministry, we can be hit with an interdict. If we can be interdicted, chances are we've committed a grave sin, that we have sinned seriously against the church. So chances are we probably shouldn't even be receiving Holy Communion at that point until we at least confess the sin. Uh, the uh, thing with being hit with an interdict, it's not so much that you, consider, uh, that you haven't committed a sin, it's that you haven't been caught or you haven't been called out. And here it says, because of if we uh, incite animosity, which means we've caused any division with the bishop, We've made, given, we've said something in a way that generates animus behavior. Even as simple as saying, I'm not a fan of Bishop Olson would be animus behavior because especially if you're in a situation where things are contentious, where you are supporting the side that says, we don't like what the bishop's doing. And then people who hear you, that would reaffirm what you're, uh, reaffirm that position that I can disagree with it. And the, the greater to which you would say you are public, you, again, I guess you'd say the prestige, the greater the prestige you hold, whether or not you claim that prestige when you're saying those, if people see you and you have prestige there, you are even more culpable of what you did because you are causing more scandal, more division by having you no know, any by having any sort of saying. Even something as simple as being a member of the Knights of Columbus or the Daughters of St. Anne goes, if you go up there and people know you for having this uh, ministry, then you are all of a sudden more responsible for that because. People will hear your voice and know that they will not necessarily hear somebody else because you're in a group that represents, that, that is held up as this is the example of what a Catholic should be. So we have to be very careful when we're in these positions about what we say, especially when we're speaking against members of the church, that we don't cause division, that we don't cause you no know, scandal, that we don't cause people to think that, okay, it is okay to disagree with the bishop, it is okay to denounce him. But like I said, even in these things, this is part of their ministry to comment on matters of politics when it, when it addresses morals. And it's their realm to just say when it addresses morals, not ours. We can't, we don't have the right to come up and say, I'm sorry, Bishop, that doesn't apply to morals. That's his decision to make. This is the, that's the decision of the rest of the church. That's not the decision of the laity. It's the decision of the magisterium. And this becomes particularly um, recently, there's a particular issue that came up, I mentioned in the beginning, where no, Bishop Olson said one apparently of apparently the most controversial things one could say. He saw on his Twitter account said, let's pray for President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris as they prepare to serve our nation in their elected offices. Let us ask the Lord for peace and the order of right reason during this transition. Funnily enough, because there's so many people have gone there and they've said, no, I'm not going to pray for them. No, they don't deserve my prayers. No, we're not supposed to be, you know, hoping anything good for you know, pre the president-elect, the vice president-elect. But it's interesting because Jesus said, uh, what Bishop Olson says, ref more actually seems to actually reflect the words of the gospel, such as in uh, Matthew chapter five, it says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly father, for he makes his son rise on the bad and the good and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same? So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus says to pray for your enemies. So assume like the worst narrative against you know, the president and the vice president-elect is true. Um, actually, assume even worse. Assume that they are actively going to come and try and kill every single Christian. Assume that's the case of what they want to do. We are still to pray for them. We're, that's not something that we should be able to go out and say, no, I disagree with that. Because if you disagree with that from Bishop Olson, you're disagreeing with Jesus Christ. Goes, and you no, know, I'm somewhat fairly certain that I could be wrong. Maybe someone contradicted me uh, on this, but I'm pretty sure that Biden and Kamala Harris did not come up with the get elected on the policy that we're going to murder all the Catholics. So 
if we're supposed to pray for them, even in that case, goes, we need to pray for them, even if they may hold uh, opinions that are contrary to what the Catholic Church teaches. Um, in Romans, uh, it tells us that for when you were slaves of, slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. But what profit did you get then from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit that you have, had, you have leads to sanctification, and its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, no, all right, say they're great sinners and everything. And no, the pen, he says the penalty of sin is death. So saying I'm not going to pray for them, that they deserve the situation in, is to say that they deserve death. But so do I. So do you. It's not certain sins that are deserving death. All sin is deserving of death. We deserve to die because of what we've done, the things we've done. None of us is any more or less deserving of salvation than the other. None of us are any more or less deserving of forgiveness than the other. All we have to do is seek it. We're going to seriously say that I'm not going to pray for somebody because they've done horrible things. They don't deserve the prayers. We're making that judgment on ourselves, too. Um, in Matthew 7, Jesus says, stop judging that you may not be judged. For as you judge, so will you be judged, and the measure with which you measure will be measured out to you. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove that splinter from your eye, while the wooden beam is in your own eye? You hypocrite. Remove the wooden beam from your eye first, then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. Now, the big thing is, and we're not focusing on the beam splinter part quite as much, but the overall message here is you judge somebody, that's the way you're going to be judged. If you decide that such a person, president, vice president, or anybody that's your enemy, does not deserve your prayers, you are making a judgment that you are not deserving of prayer. If you make a judgment that somebody is not uh, deserving of salvation, you're making a decision that you are not worthy of salvation. Because whether it be the president, the, the president-elect, the vice president, the vice president-elect, whether it be Bishop McCarrick, with all the things that he done, we can rightly say, uh, yes, they are deserving of death for the things they have done. But so are we. All of us are under the penalty of death. All of us are deserving of death. It's only through the grace of Jesus Christ that we have salvation, that we can come to spend eternity with them. Like G Jesus even says, he came not to call the righteous, but to call sinners. The, the worse off a person is doing, the more they need their prayers, not the less. So we can't be making these judgments on people. We can't be judging everybody based on what they may or may have not done wrong. And many people have done wrong. Many people have done horrible things wrong. Um, many people are doing things that makes it where we are not allowed to support them, that we are not allowed to vote for them because of policies they hold. There are certain things that we cannot support, neither it nor those who support it. But we can and should still pray for them. Because as Jesus came to save all of us, we are supposed to pray and work for the salvation of everybody else. Now, that's the end of the podcast for today. Um, if you have any questions or comments or complaints, you can always email me at august at my, uh, Saint, uh, my com. That's uh, A-U-G-U-S-T at M-Y-S-T-A-N-N.com. And we'll actually go ahead and close now with uh, Nominate Patris, Fili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tua mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc es in or mortis nostri, amen. Sancta Anna, or pro nobis, Sancta Ioannis Paul Secundum, or pro nobis, Sancta Augustini, or pro nobis, Sancta Benedicti, or pro nobis. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, amen.